From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccan. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. This is a dark tale, which is um, somewhat of our wanton warrant here on the show. However, this contains graphic descriptions of violence and abuse, and as such, may not be suitable for all audiences. Yes, very much so. This is a true crime episode, and all of those things are going to come along with it. Mm -hmm. And you know, Matt, over the years, uh, you and I have investigated any number of serial murderers, from the well-known, like Jack the Ripper-esque stuff, to the obscure, from the ancient to Mm -hmm. some that remain unapprehended in the modern day. I think we have a three-part series on that, right? Yes, several unapprehended. And uh, even, I think we've even speculated that there are uh, anywhere from tens to hundreds of uncaught, unknown serial killers that are operating. That's true. We pulled those numbers from some fairly solid databases. That wasn't just us (laughs) <laughs> choosing numbers. Yeah. Of course, they are estimations, but mm. it is uh, still a nice creepy fact just to keep with you and when you tuck into bed at night. Right. And today's episode focuses on a man you may have never heard of before unless you are someone who keeps up with this uh, grisly aspect of the news. This is a man named Samuel Little. Now, before we spoil everything, let's start with just the nuts and bolts of Samuel Little. So who is he? Here are the facts. The man we know as Samuel Little was born Samuel McDowell. He was born in 1940. On June 7th of that year, he was born in Reynolds, Georgia. It's about two hours south of Atlanta where we record this uh, this podcast. And uh, his early life, like a lot of just regular people, if you're not being written up in the media somewhere, um, is pretty short on details. He did say something uh, to the effect that his mother was a sex worker – and though not in those words. And uh, the authorities believe that he may have been born while his mother was actually in prison or incarcerated in, in, in some way. Um, and he ended up being raised by his grandmother in a completely different place in Lorain, Ohio. And his childhood, just from those circumstances alone, along with um, some other possible things that may have uh, happened to him, leads us to believe he probably had a rather difficult childhood. Yeah, he was from an impoverished family. We know he attended Hawthorne Junior High. We know that at some point he dropped out of high school due to uh, both low grades and intense behavioral issues. Yes, and I can't speak too much to this stuff, but Um, my wife has experience with children with behavioral issues, Mm -hmm. uh, the severe ones, and it tends to be something occurring within the home situation, uh, that is the biggest effect on behavioral issues within a school environment. Just putting that out there. Absolutely. So we're just painting you this picture here. It, it makes sense where his life is like at least leading to an extent. Right. Absolutely. I mean – you know, luckily, education and uh, the study of psychology and sociology, uh, these these disciplines have all evolved to the point where we can we can safely say that the majority of times when a child is uh, exhibiting behavioral issues of some sort, especially violent issues, that it's it's coming from somewhere other than them. You know, most of the time, again, just most of the time. Or many of the times. We, 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 yeah, you're right. Ben, you're absolutely right. We cannot get into mass generalizations here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just it, – it is, it is a somewhat 
trackable common thing once you get down into the nitty gritty. And that does not mean parents out there that it is your fault. Right. Just if you're, if you're listening. Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, the reason that I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm speaking in this way about it, Matt, is that I want to in the future do an episode that I'll just pitch to you now on air. It's totally okay. Say no, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, what do you think yes. about the, uh, about a future episode called, uh, can people be born evil? Oh, that's great. Yeah. Or just, just is evil real? Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Evil re- is evil real uh, is, is I think, <laughs> I don't know. It's a little different because that goes into uh, the realm of philosophy so Well, it quickly. does. Both of them are, right? So just by labeling anything evil, maybe it should be, what, what, we just need a different word for, for can people evil. be born I, terrible. Okay, it's, a, <laughs> it's a, well, there are all sorts of terrible people. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You can be terrible and not be evil. You could just be a boorish person. Yeah. But uh, but the the reason I the reason I'm asking this first off, yeah, maybe it's a little buzzfeedy to say can children be born evil. But I'm interested in the in the psychology and science behind that because sure. we we have uh, more data to bring to bear. But when we ask about does, when we ask whether evil exists, we quickly run into the comparison problem, which is, of course, one person's evil is another person's heroism, right? Anyhow, uh, Samuel Little, disturbed childhood, his criminal career begins early. He is arrested for burglary in Omaha, Nebraska on November 29th, 1956. So he's 16. And he is sentenced to serve time in a program for juvenile offenders. In his 20s, after more run-ins with crime over those intervening four years, in his 20s, he relocates to Florida where he reunites and lives with his mother. During this time, he works a variety of jobs, including stints at a cemetery. Also, during this time, he doubles down and quickly establishes his career as a prolific criminal and we're we're curating the way that we exhibit the facts here we want to build our build our case first so what do we know about what do we know about him from his 20s on sure so after 16 he gets to 17 and then really for the next 18 or so years uh, from 1957 until 1975 Little would end up getting arrested at least 26 times in 11 different states, everywhere from Ohio and Maryland to Florida, Massachusetts, out to California and Oregon, then to Philadelphia, New Jersey, Arizona, Illinois, and then Georgia again. And that's not in the order in which he was arrested. Right. Those are just, imagine traveling to all of those various places and being arrested. He was on the road frequently. He was a drifter, a transient. He was also arrested for a variety of charges. It wasn't always the same thing. He was arrested for shoplifting, for theft, for assault, for sexual assault or rape. He was arrested for aggravated assault on a police officer, DUIs, fraud, breaking and entering, solicitation of a sex worker, and more. So we're fast-forwarding to December of 1976. He is convicted of assaulting one Pamela K. Smith in Sunset Hills, Missouri, with the intent, this is the language of the law here, with the intent to ravish dash rape. And he's sentenced to three months in county jail. So he was assaulting this person and he fully intended to sexually assault them. So that was enough to lock him up for three months. He gets out. There's something else we want to we want to put. Imagine this: if this if this were true detective or a crime show, imagine this is a vignette that occurs just to the left of the main story. So, just we're imagining little. He's in trouble with the law, but let's go sideways. Let's go to October of 1982. This is the month where the skeletal remains of one Melinda LaPree were found in a cemetery in Gautier, Mississippi. She had last been seen in Pascagoula about a month earlier getting into a brown station wagon with a man that witnesses would later identify as Little. 
during the investigation, two sex workers come forward and they say that, you know, they recognize this guy. Yeah. And that he also assaulted them in Pascagoula once in 1980, once in 1981. So the next month, 1982, the next month, Little is arrested for shoplifting in Pascagoula. And police say, you know what? He matches the description of our unidentified subject in the murder of Melinda LaPree. Yeah, and he ends up getting charged with this murder uh, for this woman as well as the aggravated assaults on the other two sex workers. But here's the thing. The grand jury does not indict him. Because they doubt the trustworthiness of the witnesses. Yes, exactly. And you can imagine uh, what's going into play there with a, you know, a quote jury of his peers, unquote, of uh, the grand jury, like, taking the word of a sex worker, which is a terrible thing that it would be discounted in that way. But it, it clearly it clearly was because these witnesses were involved in what would be seen as the seedy underbelly of Pascagoula. It's right? true. It's true. Um, I understand why an individual may take the word of someone from the, you know, seedy underbelly Maybe not at face value, but it is – it's just terrible to read about it, I guess, from this end of history. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, he he gets extradited uh, outside of the state to Florida and he's going to face charges for another murder. And this was the murder of Patricia Ann Mount. She was found in Forest Grove, Florida in September of 1982 and the authorities believed that, you know, perhaps – Little is responsible, so he gets sent to Florida to at least face the, the charges. And he does go to trial. He goes to trial for the murder of Patricia Ann Mount. He is acquitted in January of 1984. In October of 1984, San Diego police officers find Little with a woman who has accused him of attacking her. So he gets arrested. He's charged in that assault and uh, one that occurred a month or so earlier that was also in San Diego. He gets tried for attempted murder in these cases. The jury deadlocks again. So instead, he pleads guilty to assault and false imprisonment. He's sentenced to four years. He serves about two and a half. On February 1st, 1987, he is on parole. He's back on the streets. He moves to Los Angeles. And then from 1990 to 2006, he has run-ins with the law in seven different states. So we can just go ahead and see here a pattern where Little seemed to be skirting by, getting, getting out of a lot of the legal troubles that he was facing and in several situations where, you know, he's being arrested – for a lot of misdemeanors, smaller things, some felonies, then he ends up, you know, getting getting out, you know, not getting indicted for a lot of these things. Then finally, he only goes to jail for two and a half years, and then, like like Ben said, he's he's out. He's on the streets for a long time. And then this begins to come to a head in 2007. Law enforcement in Los Angeles arrests Samuel Little for possession of cocaine. He is sentenced to what is called a drug diversion program. For anyone who is unaware, the idea here is that instead of ending up in the system, one may be able to get their life back on track, right? Maybe they will be able to – maybe what they need is support rather than punishment. So they have to – you know, uh, submit to drug tests. They have to attend counseling, things mm -hmm. of that nature. And some of these programs have great success. However, as soon as he is able to leave, Samuel Little is on the lam. He doesn't attend this diversion stuff because, of course, he doesn't. He does not appear in court. Uh, the judge issues a non-extraditable warrant. He gets away. The fact that it is non-extraditable will come into play soon. <laughs> yeah, extraditable to California from another state is what we're talking about there. 
Um, so then from 2007 to 2012, a lot of – there are multiple law enforcement uh, officers, individuals that – let's say, I don't know, may, what, 12, something like that. Let's just put a number to it. Uh, they come into some some kind of contact with Little. His name continues getting out there mm-hmm. with police departments. His record is growing and growing. There's a whole filing cabinet at this point of, of Samuel Little and – Somebody or so, several of these people discover that he has this warrant, but because it's non-extraditable, they end up letting him go. Again, like he's just kind of somehow just slipping through through people's grasps. Yeah, we also have to think if we you know exercise the perspective of some law enforcement communities, we also have to realize that this guy is nothing but trouble. Yeah. And so in many cases, they just want to just get just out get of out here <laughs> if he's shoplifting. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, in 2012, a detective for the LAPD named Mitzi Roberts gets a match on two cold murder cases from back in 1989 in Los Angeles. And then she checks this against the statewide offender database and she receives a match. Is uh, some kind of DNA sample, right? Yes. And this DNA match uh, identifies the DNA of Samuel Little linking him to the crimes. On September 5th, 2012, Detective Roberts gets a call from a sheriff in Louisiana. The deputies say they've traced an ATM purchase by Samuel Little to a mini mart, a convenience store in Louisville, Kentucky. And there they find Samuel Little at a nearby Christian shelter. He is arrested. He is extradited to California for that drug charge this time. And then the pieces begin coming together. Yes, the authorities there are able to at least link him to three more or different murders that occurred between 1987 and 89 over that two-year period there. Um, and, And here are their names, Guadalupe Apodaca, Audrey Nelson and Carol Alford and um, all of these people and here's that trigger warning for you had been beaten and strangled in a very similar fashion and very soon after that the police began to suspect that you know Little has been out there for a long time this is early in his life maybe he had more blood on his hands than just these three people much much more that's right they realized they were looking at a genuine serial killer. Investigations were resurrected across the country and law enforcement in multiple states began to look at other older cold cases. Think about all the places he's traveled over all of those years and all the, all the places he's operated. Um, but the authorities, even then, they didn't know that they had just captured and begun unraveling the case of the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history. Down the rabbit hole, after a word from our sponsors. Here's where it gets crazy. Let's start with what we know. During his initial trial for those first three murders... Samuel Little staunchly proclaimed his innocence even after being convicted. Things don't change until a while after he's convicted for those uh, three murders and sentenced to three consecutive life terms without parole. He eventually begins to confess other crimes. Now, it's interesting here. We're going to kind of get into it. But he doesn't want to confess or talk about anything until he knows he's not getting out of prison. Right. When he knows that there is no, no appeal, no mistrial, no legal loophole through which he can jump. There's a Texas Ranger named James Holland who enters the scene. Holland had started flying to California in 2018, just last year, to interview Little in connection to the 1994 murder of a sex worker in Odessa, Texas. Samuel Little chooses James Holland to be his confessor. To this day, if you ask Holland, he is not sure why Little chose him. But if you ask other sources, like Christina Palazzolo from the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, or VCAP, uh, she will say that 
Little was hoping for a transaction. He wanted to move to a different prison now that he knew this was his forever. So he agreed to come clean in exchange for this relocation. If I confess, you will move me. That was the devil's bargain that they made. And confess he did. According to Palazzolo, quote, over the course of that interview in May, he went through city and state and gave Ranger Holland the number of people he killed in each place. Jackson, Mississippi, one. Cincinnati, Ohio, one. Phoenix, Arizona, three. Las Vegas, Nevada, one. And just, it went on and on and on. And in May of 2018, Samuel Little confessed to the 1994 murder of Denise Christie Brothers in Odessa. That's who Holland was looking for, Texas Ranger Holland. He pled guilty to the murder of Denise Christie Brothers on December 13th, and boom, he received another life sentence. So he's up to four. And then on November 9th, he confessed to the 1996 strangulation and murder of Melissa Thomas. And this goes on and on and on, as you said, Matt. The Texas District Attorney and the Wise County Sheriff's Office also announced on November 13th that Little had not just confessed to murders in Texas. He had confessed to dozens of murders and may have committed more than 90, 90 across what they thought then was 14 states between 1970 and 2005. That, that is um, horrifying to and, imagine that. Right. And the scary thing is we don't have to imagine. All in all, at this point, Samuel Little has been linked to at least 93 separate homicides. On October of 2019, the FBI announced that Samuel Little is the most prolific known serial killer in American history. Full stop. His methods were almost always the same. Strangling, beating, and assaulting vulnerable women – people who were homeless, people who were working in the sex industry, runaways, people surviving on the fringe of mainstream society. And this may be one of the more disturbing aspects of the case that you can encounter firsthand now should you choose to. You can go see video footage of law enforcement interviewing Samuel Little, the FBI interviewing them, as he recounts in a grandfatherly warm tone with surprising clarity the appearance of each victim, their location, the names he associated with them, and so on. He also drew sketches of these victims based on his recollections. Yeah, that, that's one of the most disturbing parts of this whole thing are the sketches. Because mm -hmm. he just apparently can see them. In his mind. Right. And he doesn't have an artistic inclination. No. You know what I mean? You can tell it's 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 childlike the way it's drawn. You yeah. know what I mean? Certain certain features that he remembers are emphasized when he would see a skin tone or hair color or eye color. While his patterns of murder may not have changed, he did travel widely, as you said, Matt, and this transient lifestyle allowed him to live again on the fringes like his victims. A detective in Mississippi familiar with Little's routines described it thusly. His whole thing was shoplifting. He would work at shoplifting in a city for three or four days and then move on. He would take the items to drug areas and then sell them. Once he was done, he would go out early in the morning hours and look for women. So he had this routine, and you can see the prioritization of the routine, right? It's roughly something along the lines of steal. To get drugs. To get drugs, do drugs, and then when you're leaving town, satisfy that other compulsion. Yeah. So how did he get away for so long? It's a question we'll address after a word from our sponsor. We've returned. Let's start with why Little thought he would get away. First and foremost, and we don't want to be too, you know, like 60 minutes TV special about this, but first and foremost, we have to consider the psychological angle. He's 
like many other serial killers, he's a malignant narcissist. So he's both not very intelligent and extremely arrogant. Like some, you know, malignant narcissists have no real use in society, but they have wildly inaccurate beliefs about their own self-perceived intelligence. A nar- just like a narcissist can never forgive other people for the great sin of not being them, they're also incapable of seeing worth, ability, or intelligence in other people. So it's kind of this thing where it's like, I'm the smartest person in any room. You know what I mean? Sure. Or the most, uh, the most valuable. No one will ever catch me. Yeah. Yo, I know that feeling. You know that feeling? Oh, yeah. I'm a giant narcissist. <laughs> I would say you're the opposite, Matt. I'm always the smartest, uh, most self-centered person in every room. That's, that's all I know. <laughs> it's, and I can't say anything about you guys, especially Paul, but uh, I'm the best. <laughs> I think you're pretty great, man. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I think you're pretty um, pretty top no, notch. There's a. It's interesting. His life experience, though, kind of, kind of speaks to why he would feel that way. Mm. So, like, even if he wasn't an ingrained narcissist, I don't know how the psychology of it functions. I don't know if you sure. just one is a narcissist, but. Uh, after all of his run-ins with police over all these years, all the all the things against laws and against mm-hmm. mores and all that he'd been doing up to this point outside of homicide, um, he just gotten away with it. Hmm. So it, I can see why he would lead, go down that path of at least mentally believing that he's not going to get caught. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that too. The second thing is, as we mentioned, is victim choice. Like other would be predators, he sought the vulnerable, the weak, people who are already in some form of compromised circumstance, people who in a way were living halfway off the grid already. And like other abusers or serial murderers, uh, he was was a coward and he was just too pathetic to prey on anyone else. I mean, there's a common pattern because frankly, it works. It's time-tested, tried and true. If you want to get away with something, you find the vulnerable members of a society. And people who knew his victims, who w- could have been witnesses, could have corroborated information, maybe helped organize a search, they would also tend to be less likely to go to the police. And the police would be less likely to follow up on the assault or death of someone who had already been in and out of the system on their own unrelated criminal charges. And even if those people went to trial— As Samuel Little experienced, perhaps a jury isn't going to believe them. Right, right. Like, I can tell that person is a druggie, right? So did they remember something or did someone offer them drugs to say this? You know what I mean? And still, that's also prejudice aside. In many cases, juries might feel that they are exercising critical thinking by doing that, you know? Don't we all? think we're criticizing critical thinking. We're all to some degree assured that we're the smartest person in the room. No, it's, that's that's me. Is that you? Yeah, yeah. Remember, I'm the I'm the one. <laughs> <laughs> so please don't I'm not being serious at all in anything. <laughs> <laughs> so uh well I think you're top notch, man. I would vote for you. Well I certainly don't and I would not. So uh, there we go. What's the opposite of a narcissist? A um Human being, uh, cave a good person, sad guy. That's me. Right. <laughs> so, so in other cases, the bodies when the you know, of course, there was some sort of investigation, but bodies could be uh, unidentified. You might not find any ID. You might not find a record of them in terms of fingerprints or anything in the system, and little tended to stun or knock out his victims before he strangled them. And he was a strangler. And because of this, there were no stab marks. There were no bullet wounds, which meant that authorities could misidentify the cause of death. If you see someone who hasn't been stabbed or shot, there's no head trauma, something like that, then you you also see perhaps narcotics of some sort in, your, in their system, you could say, 
with reasonable validity that this was a drug overdose. And then if you wanted, you could explain away the bruises uh, by yes. saying life on the streets is a is an ugly, dangerous thing. Yeah, that's a that's a hard truth there. Just what what hard narcotics and a difficult life does to the body and in, in appearance mm -hmm. um, and how that could be mistaken. You're right. Well, and it's also the third thing here that we have to mention is that many of his attacks and homicides occurred before really DNA profiling was a thing where there would be databases across each state and there would be a federal database where uh, his if his DNA was found on one scene, it could just be checked, right. uh, you know, throughout. So a lot of times evidence wasn't available that could that could provide really a clear link to him. Again, you've got witnesses maybe that are in the area who are saying he's somewhere. Or you think you may have got a hit somewhere or you do end up getting a DNA hit like well, the previous occurrence that we talked about mm -hmm. at the top of the show mm -hmm. where it just gets linked to this one thing in this one case in this one state or maybe even county. Right. Absolutely. And so, again, to be clear, we're not saying law enforcement was doing a bad job. We're, no. We're saying that these tools were not available over the course of this long and bloody career. Another factor, the fourth factor here is that Little, as we said, shared the fringe with his victims. He was a known transient. He had a rap sheet that was quickly becoming a novel and it was for largely petty crime. Uh, violent assault aside, a lot of his, his – the, the bulk of his charges were for things like shoplifting, fraud, theft. Yep. So authorities were often glad to get him booted out of – get out of here. He's out of here. Yeah. Instead of digging further into his murky past and it is important, it is crucial to remember that he would have been caught years or even decades earlier had DNA testing been available. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And th there's another factor here mm -hmm. where we're talking about his transients and um, how he's sharing the fringe with his victims. Remember that the people living on fringes in local areas maybe are not so transient, um, who aren't just you know traveling around as much as Little was, mm -hmm. where he, the people he's interacting with uh, maybe just don't know who he is. He's just new in an area and let's say he attacks somebody pretty pretty soon after arriving in an area uh, and then just disappears to go somewhere else. Um, every time, it's not just law enforcement that uh, he is presenting himself anew to. It's everybody in every place that he's traveling to across the country. Yeah, and let's consider also, you know, there's there's more than a little bit of institutionalized racism, whether implicit, explicit, conscious or subconscious, that says, you know, be on the lookout for unidentified black male. Did we mention that he's black at any time in this episode before oh, this? Oh, no. I don't think we did. No. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a – I mean the statistics bear it out that serial killers in general, and it's not always, are a white male. Apprehended. Apprehended serial killers are white males. <laughs> um, yes. Um I mean, that's just what we've seen from the statistics after studying it mm -hmm. uh, over all these episodes here and speaking mm -hmm. with, with professionals over the course of several different podcasts. Um, yeah, it, Samuel Little certainly um, stands out because of his – the number of people that he's attacked, because of uh, who he is and – I mean, there's so many things. That and because of the demographics. Out. Yeah, the demographics alone. Yeah, I, I believe uh, – um Another example would maybe be Lonnie David Franklin, also mm. known as the Grim Sleeper. Yeah. Uh, but Franklin at this point is known for at least 10 murders, yeah. not 93. Well, yeah, or like Wayne Williams. Or Wayne know. Williams, um, yeah. Or the DC Snipers, which they're not serial killers necessarily. They're spree, spree killers. killers. Well, and you know, you and I may have slightly different opinions about the Wayne Williams case. I don't think we do. Um but if you would like to – Well, is is your opinion that he probably did kill uh, quite a number of them, but there are several on the list that he almost certainly did not kill? My opinion in the legal fact is they was convicted of two murders that do not fit the demographics of the victims of the rest of the Atlanta child murders. Okay. Sounds good. I mean that's just the fact. That's what he's convicted of, right? I mean yes, that's the truth, but – 
Yes. And I'm not, I'm not here to defend him in any way. No, I get it. That's what the whole ep- show was about. <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, the whole point. I think if, over time, after uh, enough interaction, like, you know, secondhand interaction with him directly. Um, mm, mm. So if you want. And, and John Douglas. If you want to learn more about what we're talking about, um, check out. Check out Matt's show that he created it's not in mine. collaboration it's with not Tenderfoot. Mine. Is didn't you? I, no, you produced not, it. Yeah, yeah, but it's not my show. That's Payne Lindsay's show, my friend. Okay, well, check out the show Matt and Payne did called Atlanta Monster, and check out the follow up, which is very much Matt's show. Uh, that he does a lovely job on called Zodiac. Yeah, and just because we're here, and who sure. knows when this comes out? Okay, the third season will be available in January. Mm-hmm. Any spoilers for the audience? We mentioned the the subject that it's about previous to this moment within this podcast. There we go. I like this spoiler a lot. And I got to say, I love a good long-form uh, true crime narrative. I'd love to work on one someday. Uh, I think that if you are – I hesitate to say fan of true crime, but if you are interested in this and you want to hear top-notch research and um, – just a masterfully done show, then check out the Monster series. The first two seasons are already out. I believe season two is ongoing too, right? Yeah, well, Atlanta Monster and the the Zodiac Killer both have bonus content at some point Mm -hmm. coming out, and they always will. They will have something. Oh, fantastic. Yes, do check them out and let us know what you think. You mentioned something. You said long-form true crime, and now I just want to see long-form true crime improv. I want to see that. Like, what is that? What is long form true crime improv? Uh, comedic improv, <laughs> or like long long form true improv crime? Oh well, <laughs> for people who've been to some of my shows, they would say any improv I do is a crime. Oh, uh, against I a good taste. Disagree. While we're patting each other on All the back, right. you're an excellent improviser. That's very sir. kind. I've seen you numerous times. We're we're. Uh, we're hoping to allay a little bit of the darkness here yep. because we're talking about some very uh, some some very troubling things, both with the system in which these crimes occur and with the individual and with what this means for the future. Because the last factor in why Little would get away for so long, why he thought he would get away for so long is simply this. He seemed absolutely fine with going down for a drug possession, burglary, shoplifting, DUI, rap, or something like that. But he always fought murder charges and for a long time, as you heard in our uh, our recounting of this chronology, he came away clean. In the 1980s, as we said, he was charged with killing women in two different states, but he escaped indictment in Mississippi and he escaped conviction in Florida and even after – being convicted of three murders in California. That was in 2014. Remember those 1980s mm-hmm. cold cases? He refused to admit to the crimes that dated back to the 1980s. It was, as you said, Matt, only when he realized this would be his forever that he decided to make these confessions. And, and this, then perhaps some yeah. fame was also involved. Right. And this leads us to something that I like to call the Lucas problem. Uh, so what makes... Samuel Little different from these uh, criminals. I mean, they're scum, whatever. These people who say that they have murdered a lot of other innocent people, it's it's no secret that he's not unique in this kind of confession. There's, of course, the famous case of Henry Lee Lucas, for whom the Lucas problem is named. Henry Lee Lucas would go on to confess to over 300 murders. He said that he and his compatriot Otis Toole were yeah. in the service of something called the Hand of Death, which we, I think, did an episode yeah, on. Yeah, 4Pi was yeah. another name for it, I guess. Now, the 4Pi idea did have a little bit more sand to it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that Is it one, not the same thing? It's 4Pi. Four, four they're pi. related. They're related. Oh, okay. Yeah, All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. I still think about that one. Me too. (laughs) Well, okay, so here's the Lucas problem. Simply put, it's this. So like most serial killers, again, Lucas is of below average intelligence. He's also easily manipulated by law enforcement, and he's going to be in jail, like Little, for the rest of his life. Nothing he can do. Game, set, and match. 
this is this is maybe not officially true. This is not admitted by a lot of law enforcement, especially people involved directly with the Lucas case. But the fact of the matter is that evidence overwhelmingly suggests unscrupulous law officers used Henry Lee Lucas to close out cold cases. Mm. And you know about this. We talked about this. Well, yeah. I mean, that that's the thing. He could and would straight up confess to crimes, even if it's not – within the realm of possibility that he could physically be in the location where a homicide occurred. Like there's no way he could have been in that scene. But he would do that in exchange for little things here and there, mm -hmm. perks, if you will, within the prison system. And so, you know, I'll sure I'll confess to that crime if you get me X. Right, right. And, you know, there, there are a thousand ways to message that or speak about it such that if a tape were played back, someone in law enforcement could say, well, we didn't tell him to yeah. say it. He wasn't coerced. He just stated that. You know, like, so what can you tell me about, you know, I'm just making this up, but like, what can you tell me about Linda Alvarez in, you know, uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida, in insert time here. Uh, sorry, Linda, for using your name, but uh, we'll continue here. It's just fictional. This is not a real Linda. It's not based on real Linda. Uh, but, uh, and while they're saying it, and maybe they're just recording audio, <laughs> they slide across a folder or the, a jacket with, with the facts of the case in there. And on top of that, there's like a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. It's that simple. It is that simple for that kind of thing to occur. You should and have seen how Ben was slowly pushing this um, made-up folder towards me as he was explaining it to me <laughs> and maintaining eye contact. It was awesome. Well, I hope that we are never in a situation like that where we have to bribe or be bribed with cigarettes to confess yeah. to murders we didn't commit. But that is – okay, so that's the Lucas problem. You cannot believe these untrustworthy people, especially when they are incentivized to lie. But Little's case is different. Why? It really has to do with the amount of information and detail that he was able to provide. And he was doing it unprompted by law enforcement. He was doing, doing it for this individual, Holland, who showed up at his prison looking for one specific – or answers to one specific case. Um, and just the number of crime scenes that he can give details about – very specific stuff. And a lot of this, um, a lot of these details weren't a part of the public facing investigation, right? Yeah. Where um, reporters didn't, weren't privy to a lot of the information that somehow Samuel Little knows. Yeah. And this is, this is a brilliant thing that law enforcement has learned to do because it gives you a way to understand. The weird thing is that there are, there's, are false confessions all the time, especially if something reaches public panic level. Like during yeah. during the Son of Sam murders, how many people wrote in just because they um, mistook their ideas for clever pranks? They would write in and say, like, I'm the Son of Sam killer. But they don't know anything that hasn't been released mm -hmm. to, to through the papers yet. It's particularly difficult when there's a lot of press or, or leaks have occurred. Exactly, exactly. So he passes that test. He knows stuff that has not been released to the public or has not at the very least not been widely circulated. And the information he provided has been corroborated in multiple cases. Again, the thing that – this is just maybe one person's opinion. But the thing that bothers me the most about this is that you can go on YouTube. You can see the FBI interviewing Samuel Little and you can see his warm, uh, grandfatherly – or avuncular, I guess, depending on how old you are, a, uh, his tone as he recalls the specifics of these murders. He is never going to leave prison, not while he's alive. He has nothing left to lose, and likely that media attention is attractive to him, as well as the opportunity to recount and therefore relive his crime. There is one issue with Little's recollection. It is his issue with chronology. As you said, Matt, he is um, incredibly lucid when it comes to remembering details of victims, locations, you know, their appearances, the the order of operations mm -hmm. of these 
atrocious acts, but he's bad at remembering specific dates. And to be honest, I don't think that means he's making it up, and I don't think it means it should be dismissed. Like no. most people have a problem with specific dates. Oh, sure, and especially when you're traveling as much or traveled as much as he has mm -hmm. to all these varying places. Like, Add to that the years of heavy drug use. Yeah. So this leads us to some implications that we may have mentioned at the top of the show. First, there is more to come. This tale has not concluded. Of the 90-plus murders Little has confessed to from 1970 to 2005, the FBI currently has solidly connected him to at least 50. Wow. That we know of. That doesn't include murders that he may not have confessed to yet. Nor does it include other connected murders the FBI may have yet to publicly confirm, right? Yeah. And there may be more cases like this on the way. I don't know if you heard about this. A crime scene DNA company just acquired the database that was used to apprehend the Golden State Killer, which means that now— Is that—wait, are they using the GEDmatch thing? Is that what it's talking about? I believe so, yeah. Whoa. It is GEDmatch. Oh, my gosh. That is a powerful tool. Whoa. And now it's going to be used specifically by this crime scene DNA forensics company or profiling company. Holy mackerel. So there may be more on the way, but we're also in a ticking clock situation because as we record this, Samuel Little is 79 years old. He is in bad health. He will stay in prison in Texas until his death. So the goal becomes one of identifying his victims and providing closure and justice in these unsolved cases that were formerly going to be relegated to the cold case files. VCAP, which we mentioned earlier, Palazzolo's organization, is hoping this case will serve as a reminder to every jurisdiction of the importance of consistent crime reporting and interdepartmental, interagency communication. Absolutely. So... Um, gosh, so what, what can we do? What can you do? Well, if you have any information linking, uh, little to a place or time, especially if it's, uh, in corroboration in some way with the confessions that he's made, you can actually, you can call the FBI. I know that sounds a little scary, maybe just the concept of calling the FBI, but I assure you, you can do it. You can give your information. Uh, this is the number. Here it is. 1-800-C-A-L-L-F-B-I or call FBI. You can also, if you don't want to use the phone, submit a tip online at their website, tips.fbi.gov. This has one last implication that we want to leave everyone with. And it is not a happy implication, nor should it be. Coupled with the recently apprehended Golden State Killer, Joseph James D'Angelo Jr., well, he hasn't been convicted, but his DNA has been linked. Yeah, it's solid. Yeah, I'm, we're not in a court of law, so I'm just going to say it. He did it. He murdered those people. But coupled with that, this apprehension, this understanding of Samuel Little raises the chilling possibility – I would argue, just my opinion, plausibility, that there are more criminals like this out there, people who were maybe caught for unrelated crimes, people who retired from their, their bloody careers before they were caught, and much more. So we have to ask ourselves, who else is out there still? It's a question that brings a, 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 a silence inside me, as, as strange as that sounds, because I'm not I now I'm not trying to be alarmist and say that there's 15 people out there. Yeah, there are 50. Well, according to the FBI, <laughs> right? Sure. But but I it's completely uh, possible um that it's completely plausible that there are a handful mm -hmm. of people who read the news about monsters like Samuel Little or uh the Golden State Killer and said, "Whew, close call." Yikes. And we want to know what you think. Are there more cases like this on the way? Is Samuel Little someone who is going to be in 10, 20 years just recognized as the second most prolific? 
Who will they catch next? Let us know. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Twitter. Uh, We especially like to recommend our Facebook community page. Here's where it gets crazy to continue this conversation. Absolutely. Go hang out with your fellow listeners, with all of us over there, um, just chewing the fat on every one of these episodes that we put out. If you want to call us and give us some specific information, we have a number. It's pretty easy. You can leave a message. The number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. Did you mention Instagram? I don't think you did. We are Conspiracy Stuff Show. I said we were on Instagram, yeah, but, but I didn't tell people we gotta, where. We, you got to know, Conspiracy Stuff Show. Make sure we've got the most – is it followers on Instagram? I, sure, yeah. Uh, fans, people who hang out, friends. Compatriots. We want to have the most friends on Twitter. Co-conspirators. <laughs> Co-conspirators. There we go. Uh, I don't know anything. And if none of that quite bags your badgers, if our various unfortunately accurate episodes on big data and Facebook persuaded you to log off the social meds entirely, God. Yeah, then uh, you have one other way to contact us. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.